I'm the Talking Skull, and this year, I've played 35 classic first-person shooters to witness the birth of the FPS genre. I've followed the budding scene through its formative years, felt the jump to true 3D, watched the floundering console attempts, and seen bold studios push the genre forward year after year. Now, I've reached the end of my journey. If you're watching this video, you probably don't need me to tell you how significant Halo was. It revolutionized shooters on console, invented the analog stick aiming most of us know today, and almost single-handedly earned Microsoft a spot in the console war. By the summer of 2000, console shooters were in a sorry state. Technology moved fast in the 90s, and while the PlayStation and N64 smoked PCs at launch, within just a few years, they had fallen far behind. But beyond the weaker hardware, console shooter design had fallen into a rut as well, still stuck on overly simple corridors and the pseudo-light gun controls of GoldenEye. While visionary studios like Epic and Valve had been innovating on PC, the console space had been stagnant since GoldenEye. But in the fall of 2000, all that changed. A new console generation arrived, technologically fresh and ripe for boundary pushing. Dual analog sticks became standard, and established developers brought veteran insight to cutting-edge hardware. And no developer brought more experience than Bungie. Getting in on the ground floor to compete with Doom 2 in 1994, Bungie broke boundaries for years with the Marathon series, and left the FPS scene before most recognizable studios even started. The years since Marathon had left Bungie desperate. Their RTS, Myth the Fallen Lords, easily eclipsed Marathon in sales, but delays to the sequel and a costly recall left the studio broke. Bungie needed a helping hand to finish out the development of their, at the time, Mac-exclusive open-world RTS stroke third-person shooter, Halo. That helping hand would come in the form of Microsoft. Previously, Mac Monogamous Bungie became a Microsoft developer, Halo became an Xbox exclusive, and after a year of intense work and soul-searching, Master Chief finally saw the light of day. Marathon fans would recognize remnants of their beloved franchise all over Halo. Marathon's distinct assault rifle and pulse pistol return, AI motifs run parallel, and references abound. They're everywhere! And perhaps more than anything else, Marathon carried a legacy of multiplayer excellence. Bungie had built fleshed out multiplayer modes, including King of the Hill, Oddball, and Co-op, way back in 1994 and 95, when other developers barely managed Deathmatch. Halo's multiplayer offerings were cobbled together at the last minute, but the strength of the game's foundations and Bungie's experience with multiplayer yielded one of the best multiplayer games on the market anyway, and by far the best on consoles. It's ironic, because Halo offers almost no new multiplayer features compared to Marathon 2. But even all these years later, few shooters had caught up to Marathon 2's six modes, and Halo's unique strengths, built for the solo campaign, turned its multiplayer into something special. The campaign's aggressive checkpoints allow fallen co-op buddies to come back quickly. The limited weapon slots and constantly looting guns from dead aliens keeps both co-op players always fully armed, and vehicles drive more dynamic, varied PvP battlefields, especially with separate passenger roles and larger, more open maps than any arena shooter. One thing Halo's PvP lacked compared to competitors like Unreal Tournament and Perfect Dark was bots. Halo bafflingly launched with no bots at all a year before Xbox Live enabled online play, rendering Halo's robust multiplayer completely unplayable without in-person friends. This wasn't a deal-breaker, as GoldenEye showed, but 
bots had become a staple of the genre. In 2001, it was strange to see a major multiplayer release without them. Even stranger because Halo's campaign showcased the best enemy AI ever seen. Halo's Covenant provided dynamic engagements with an emotional arc. The first act as you probe for weaknesses and take out key targets. The second act as grunts lob grenades while elites run for cover. Then a finale as elites charge in to finish you off while grunts flee for their lives. This sense of progression and flow to fights is further reinforced by Halo's unique loadout system. Where other FPS campaigns saw you accumulating progressively more and more cumbersome arsenals, desperately cycling through too many options in the heat of combat, Halo reined in the bloat by only letting you carry two weapons at a time. Instead of gradually accumulating cludge over the course of the game, Master Chief loots new guns off his slain opponents and throws out his old ones. This has a few major benefits. Most obviously, players never have to futz with their inventory. Anytime you swap weapons, you know exactly what you're swapping to. Bungie even breaks punches and grenades out onto their own buttons, allowing the player more in-the-moment combat options with less fiddling. Second, because you only ever have one off weapon, the previous and next buttons of Perfect Dark and Red Faction could be condensed into a single swap button, freeing up room for other commands. A much needed consideration for the Xbox, whose controller had this nonsense instead of bumpers, especially with punch and grenade now taking up two precious inputs. Third, this weapon swapping kept the pace high. Instead of hoarding ammo, Halo pushes you to use everything you've got, then dump your used up guns and start fresh. These pace upping changes were necessary too, since Halo also slows the pace down with rechargeable shields. This shield system strikes a nice balance between the old school hit point method and not yet made modern shooters full regeneration. With Halo, shields keep your health from being nickel and dimed, but still let you feel the bite of your larger mistakes. They encourage you to take risks and let you continue to progress even after the scrappiest encounters, at a cost. This relieves balancing pressure from Bungie, making tough encounters beatable even for players with 10 HP in a dream. I do wish that the recharge started a little quicker though, since Halo had me doing the now common sit on your ass and wait till you're allowed to play routine for the first time. And that wait brutalizes the pace. I can only imagine John Romero would have torn out his beautiful hair at this hide and wait mechanic. Pacing also gets gummed up in Bungie's ever confusing level design. Halo's maps never get as annoying as Marathon or Marathon Infinity, but the same old problems still show up. We still have the mazes, the indistinguishable samey corridors, and the undirected backtracking. It's bizarre to see Bungie still struggling with this. In Halo, these issues are toned way down, but if anything, they're even more out of place now that lock and key style navigation has been phased out in favor of more linear action. Compared to Half-Life or Red Faction, these levels flow like vanilla ice. Bungie even had to snag the idea of on-screen objective markers from Rainbow Six and other more open-ended games. In the best cases, these signals enable Bungie to use open, undirected layouts and let you find your own way to the objective, throwing you into a huge war zone and letting you pick your way through. But at their worst, these waypoints show up to explain that, yes, that room was a dead end a minute ago, and yes, we specifically led you away from it, but now it's the only path forward and we need you to go there now, please thank you. And why is everything so dark? When I first played a year ago, I literally used the remastered visuals as a flashlight. It's not that the remaster looks better, it doesn't. Just that certain missions get so dark that enemies blend right into the background even with the flashlight. Add in too many instant kills and your own allies shooting your escort mission in the back of the head, and Halo can be quite frustrating. Like, I get that the energy sword is iconic, but Halo has a built-in metric for how much damage players should take. 
The whole point of the shield system is to allow you to recover from taking a hit. The most punishing attacks should only take out your shields and a tick or two of health. But multiple common enemies take out all of your shields and health with one blow. Halo gets away with all of this because of its overly protective checkpoint system, but getting instigibbed in a game like this just isn't fun. Playing out of your mistakes makes for all the most exciting moments. Randomly dying to a rocket from an indeterminate source in the middle of a mass of mobs kills the fun. Ugh, am I seriously giving a negative review to Halo? No, no. This game is great. Any complaints about Halo wind up as footnotes on the legacy of a game with more style and substance than any other shooter of its day. Clever input buffering and interpretation allow Halo's movement to feel less awkward, and its aim assist less jarring. Where Goldeneye and Red Faction grabbed your reticle and threw it around the screen, Halo kept your aim centered, but any time you moved your analog stick, the game would subtly autocorrect toward targets. These kinds of innovations pervade Halo. I love the weapon pickups, the AI, the vehicles! Other developers had tried their hand at adding vehicle segments, but Halo's vehicles are more varied, less glitchy, and more importantly, control smoothly. Bungie had tried to make a vehicular combat game as early as 1996, before the 3D tech was even close to ready. With Halo, the time had finally come. The Warthog's bizarre steering may take some getting used to, but it undeniably handles better than previous attempts like No One Lives Forever's Barfer Cycle. These vehicles move faster, turn harder but more gradually, and tackle uneven terrain comfortably. And Bungie built in allowances for tricky edge cases to ensure you'll never get stuck, even when attempting truly stupid stunts. Add the Scorpion, Ghost, and Banshee, and Halo pushes vehicles from a novelty into a fully-fledged core feature. Vehicular combat drips from every panel of Master Chief's metal-pecked body. And just look at these gorgeous vehicles. There's such a tangible distinction between the boxy gray and green human equipment and the elegantly curved purple Covenant tech. And I can't help noticing... That division is more than just skin deep, too. Human tech is all grounded and practical, with cars on wheels and guns with magazines full of bullets, while Covenant vehicles hover and fly, and their weapons shoot energy blasts with unique mechanics. All this sci-fi tech is then juxtaposed against the floods, sinewy, fleshy corruption, and backed by cutting-edge graphics rendering huge arenas, stunning vistas, charming animations, and intricate energy effects. And who can deny that theme? Adaptive soundtracks had become common by this point, but Halo's score transitions more smoothly, matches the action better, and lands harder than any previous iteration. But the whole time I was playing Halo, an intrusive thought kept pestering me. It's a thought I've had over and over throughout this series. One that I never anticipated at the start, but which, for a long time, has dominated my perspective on everything I've played. Will any of these games ever be as fun as Doom? I asked it when I played Duke Nukem 3D and questioned the sound effects and encounter design. I asked it when I played Quake and lamented the small weapon count and lackluster ending. I asked it again when I pondered Marathon Infinity's messy level design, again when I complained about arbitrary deaths and pitfalls in Shadow Warrior, and again with the N64 port of Rainbow Six when Mercenary asked me how I felt about aiming on the N64. You have to physically hold the stick in place. Right. In the years after Doom, plenty of shooters added new features. A select few were even more polished than Doom. But eight years worth of games later, I still thought back on Doom fondly, even while actively playing other newer shooters. I somehow already developed nostalgia for a game I just played for the first time this year.
I never intended this series to be about Doom. I had genuinely anticipated not liking it that much. But the leap from Wolfenstein 3D to Doom is like the leap from Metroid 2 to Super Metroid. It's like the leap from Mario Clash to Mario 64. You might be thinking, what the hell is Mario Clash? The more astute of you might be thinking, yeah, but Mario 64 and Super Metroid were both on newer consoles. That's how big the leap is from Wolfenstein 3D to Doom. Carmack, Romero, and their team packed an entire console generation's worth of technological and game design advancements into the one-year Doom development, and the result perfectly crystallizes an exact vision of bloody exhilaration. Eight years after Doom, Halo solidified a paradigm shift in the FPS genre. Since Unreal and Half-Life in 1998, and arguably Goldeneye the year before, the genre had been pushing away from straight-into-the-action fun and toward games that were more about their specific aesthetics and themes. Halo refines this into its most focused form yet, a game that's entirely about being epic. Where id's classics were about action, Halo is about epicness. Dire stakes, sweeping vistas, and a rousing score convey a sense of weight and majesty that elevate Halo, if only slightly, from a breezy romp into an experience. A carefully crafted emotional journey that sweeps you up and stirs something in you beyond a simple adrenaline rush. And, ironically, this very paradigm shift is part of the reason we look back fondly on what came before. We've had 20 years of cinematic games where even the simplest knee-jerk violence from the AAA scene demands a dense wrapping of dialogue and set dressing. But it's nice from time to time to just pop open a no-frills arcadey action game that lets you get down to it. Uh, who, what true Doom murderhead is going to open up Doom and play a level every now and again? Every once in a while, you think, while you're working on a video game or thinking about video games, you remember a Doom level and you pop Doom open. That's why you keep it on your Windows desktop at all times. You always, no icons on your desktop, just Doom. Halo strikes a balance. It's not high art like some of Bungie's previous works, but it leans on the scales just hard enough to guide our emotions. Combining the second best cutscenes on the market with Half-Life style scripted events, environmental storytelling, and memorable twists, Bungie elevates its insubstantial plot enough to get you invested, to supplement its action thrill ride with horror, betrayal, humor, and wonder. In exchange for breaking up the action, Halo gives us real dramatic tension, memorable scenes, and one hell of a climax. This past year has been a wild ride. I'm proud of how much I've improved as a video producer, and I'm glad for all I've learned about the classics from this genre I grew up with. However, I have basically been crunching non-stop for the past nine months to get these videos out the door. I loved working on this project, but it's high time I took a break. I don't think I'll ever commit to a weekly release schedule again. Moving forward, I intend to make better researched, more focused, analytical videos breaking down specific elements of games, and I hope you'll join me. But first, I need some time to relax, and finally start some games that have been sitting on my to-do list for far too long. I'll see you all again before the end of the year.